Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern. Tonight, a depressing job numbers report. Joe Biden comes down to Dixieland. Dollars for donuts. And should we sell in May and go away? That and more tonight, all on Wall Street Wrap Up. Hi, and welcome to Wall Street Wrap Up, and hope your week went well. I'm Andre Laborde. Our goal is bringing Wall Street to your street for today, Friday, May the 7th, 2021. And to get you ready for the events ahead for next week, we've got a great show for you this evening, so stick around. We'll also be talking with the former director of the Congressional Budget Office, Douglas Holtz Eakin. With all the spending proposed by the Biden administration, we'll get an insider's perspective. But first, how do the markets do this week? Well, all the averages closed in the green for today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average ended the week at 34,776. That's up 227 points for the day and up about 2.5% for the week. The S&P 500 closed today at 4,232, up 30 points for the day and up about one and a quarter percent for the week. And finally, the NASDAQ. They finished the week at 13,752, up 119 points for the day and down one and a half percent for the week. The Dow Jones and the S&P 500 posted record highs. And Bitcoin. Well, Bitcoin closed for the week, ending today at $57,848. It's up almost $1,900 for the day. Well, let's get to our guest tonight, Douglas Holtz Eakin. Well, he's an economist. He's president of the American Action Forum, and he's the former director of the Congressional Budget Office. Doug, welcome to Wall Street Wrap Up. Thanks for having me. The president has said that he guarantees that no one making over $400,000 will pay not one penny of these tax cuts. Uh, excuse me, these tax hikes. What do you say? Uh, I would politely disagree. Um, you can try to insulate the uh, most of the people from the tax increases, but you can't insulate the economy from the negative impacts of what they're proposing. So the short list is raise the top rate to 39.6, tax capital gains as ordinary income, so sharp increase in the, the t rate of tax on capital gains, uh, get rid of uh, step up in basis of debt, so again, a sharp increase in uh, taxation of capital gains, raise the corporate rate, have a global minimum tax. You go down that list, you have a whole series of things which would raise the tax on the return to capital and thus diminish the incentives to save, innovate, and invest in the United States. If you do that, our workers end up with less modern equipment, less equipment, uh, software that's out of date, they're less productive, they, they don't get the real wage increases that they might otherwise have. You get the kind of stagnation that produced real frustration in the slow growth of standards of living, and that's the burden of the tax. It's not over there on the top 1%, it's on the average American who's not getting a raise and not getting ahead. And well, I, and I don't understand how all the all the proposals of the tax increases will only be paid by the top one percent. Um, you know, giving it to the other guy. It, I, the math just doesn't seem to add up, does it? This doesn't add up. Uh, if you listen to what they're saying, they're saying, "Look, we're going to permanently increase these taxes." And then we're going to extend for a number of years these new social safety net programs, child tax credits, certain income tax credits, premium tax credits, um, you know, maybe do some infrastructure. But the real heart of this is permanent tax increases for temporary extensions of the social safety net. Mm -hmm. That means when those extensions run out, they're going to want to renew them. Where's the money come from then? You've now taxed the, the high end. You've promised not to tax the 400000 and under. So you have a real problem. It's not adding up. And if you decide to tax those making less than 400000 what are you going to do with Social Security and Medicare when that bill comes due? We have existing safety net programs that need money. They're inventing new safety net programs that are going to need money, and they're running out of people who have money. And, and that's the problem. And, and also talking about Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, so, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Social Security is supposed to be running out in 2035, and the Medicare and Medicaid is supposed to be in five years, which 
you know, it's, it's in 20, you know, 2026 is only a, just around the corner. I don't think we'll make it five years. I think we, we got four years at best going into the pandemic. It probably looked like four may, may have shrunk some. Mm -hmm. I think so. Security, we have 10. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are programs that people are relying on. They have they have made their lifetime plans around their their existence and the benefits in there. And Congress needs to get serious about shoring them up. But you can't use the money you're going to need to shore them up on something new. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the problem they face right now. Larry Lindsay wrote a wrote an interesting piece in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago, maybe maybe it might have been last week, where he was talking about the the child care benefits that what Joe Biden wanted to do was cap it at 7%. And he said it's it's going to be a, a horrible idea because the the greatest way for people not to care about how much something costs is to know that anything over 7%, the other guy in this case, the government is going to be paying for it. Do, is, do you feel that way too? Yeah, there's a, a serious um, uh, underappreciation of the the role of cost in sort of checking behavior and, and allocating resources in our, in our economy. They want to have you know free community college. Well, people will te uh, treat free community college as if it had no value. Mm -hmm. And and if you have childcare that's capped at seven percent of your income. Who cares if it really costs 10, 12, 13, 14? Uh, it, that's not on your tab and you won't care. So uh, I think they really have created a whole set of bad incentives uh, in, in these proposals. They have a big expansion of benefits that you can get without working. That's, those are health insurance benefits, uh, the so-called premium tax credits, the child credit, no work requirements. It's a lot of money on the table. Eventually, if you put enough money on the don't bother to work part of the equation, that's what people will do. It was in uh, Wednesday's Wall Street Journal that the uh, the governor of Montana is now telling the federal government, you, you know where I'm going on this. He's saying oh, yeah. we will not accept after I think after June 30th or July 30th, the three hundred dollars for additional payment that we don't want it because people are just sitting back and not not coming to get a job. To accept the free money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the I told you so moment uh, from from the beginning of uh, the, the pandemic when they offered a $600 a week bonus. So that's, you know, $15 an hour for a 40 hour work week. That's an enormous bonus on top of the regular state unemployment benefit. There were concerns about what was going to happen to the labor market. But in those days with the virus rampant, a lot of people didn't want to go out, might not even be safe to go out and work. So it was uh, perhaps more understandable. But when they decided to renew this and put it at $300 a week, it was clear that we were getting ahead of the virus. The vaccines were in place. Uh, the economy was, was growing at a 6% rate um, early in the year. All the, the daily indicators indicated that. You were going to need workers and need them soon. And by our math, 50% of those on that benefit were making more by being unemployed than they were at their previous jobs. That's a huge impediment to getting people back to work. It's a huge impediment to having the small businesses who are finally getting a chance to start back up and, and get going again, get the workers they need. Uh, it's a policy error, and they, and they really ought to fix it. And the governor of Montana thought, okay, I'll fix it. Mm -hmm. We are walking away. There are Democrats in Congress right now that when this extra $300 expires at the end of July, that they want to renew it again. I don't know if you've heard that. Now, I don't know if there's enough Ooh. enough political fight for them to renew it, or if there's enough political fight for them to stop it. But uh, have you heard what the latest is? Uh, there is a big sentiment uh, on the progressive side of the aisle mm -hmm. to renew this benefit. Indeed, one of the favorite ideas of the progressives is to have unemployment insurance be on a schedule, and it only goes down when the unemployment rate goes down enough. So they, they want to put this on autopilot not leave it up to Congress, just have it uh, dictated by a formula. Well, you know how that will work. It's going they to stay always up. <laughs> I know how that will work. The benefit will be too big. They'll say, oh, we're not going to reduce this benefit until unemployment gets to 1%. It'll, it'll never go down. It'll only go up, and, and we'll have a really big problem with the labor market. So Another entitlement. You were former director of the Congressional Budget Office, and we were, it's a, a nonpartisan group, and uh, that was set up in 1974 by Congress. And there right now we're talking, well, we're talking about the, the, the tax hikes, but one of the tax hikes is the uh, corporate tax hike that presently is at uh, 20, uh, 21% and wanting to raise it to 28%. What do you think that'll do to corporations? Oh, I think this is really simple. Uh, for those of us who lived through the, the, the years 2005 to 2016, 
We saw 100 American corporations leave the United States and move their headquarters overseas. And from the day that law passed, we didn't see any, zero. There was one that, that started to invert in January of 2018, but it changed its mind and came back. So uh, all we're doing is restarting a problem that was an annual perennial battle about Benedict Ar Arnold firms leaving the United States. It, again, when we got the rate to 21%, we were in the middle of the pack of the developed world in place with our competitors. Mm -hmm. 28 puts us way out of line and we start that problem all over again. So it really is not a good idea. Including with that, since we did lower it from, uh, what th what was that? I think 35% to 21%, yeah. that there's a number of countries now that also were lowering their tax rate to be, of course, more competitive. Well, now that they're lowering their rate, okay, and we want to go back from 21 to right now, the, uh, Joe Biden wants 28. Uh, and when you add in an additional the additional surtaxes, that's going to add it up even, even even more so. And by the way, Doug, what you're talking about was inversions. This is where when a company will go ahead and make their headquarters not in the United States, but let's say, let's say Ireland that has a lower tax rate, they'll still sell the products here in the United States, but they're headquartered in Ireland rather than right here in the United States. Oh, yeah. No, this was, as you know, this was a big problem. Um, we had a system that, that trapped the, the earnings of big, successful U.S. firms overseas. So it was not coming back to the U.S. to be used productively here. It was parked overseas. The 17 law fixed all of that. And, and it really would be a mistake to, to try to undo the 17 law and restart those problems. The, the irony here is that by suggesting we go to 28 percent, the Biden administration knows that's, that's too high. So what's their solution? Well, let's have a global minimum tax where everybody agrees to charge 21. We're, we're charging people too much. We'll, we'll just get everyone else to tax too heavily, too. Mm -hmm. it, that's never going to fly, and, and we're going to have a problem. Well, and they won't have a—I mean, it won't be global because it's too competitive where, like we said, right. that other countries were lowering their rates as well, too. The Congressional Budget Office, if I remember correctly, did a, did a survey that said that 70 percent of corporate taxes are passed to the workers. Do I have yeah. that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's pretty simple. If, if you're operating a, a corporation and suddenly you have a, a, a hundred million dollar tax bill, you have to come up with the money somewhere. You don't have any more money. So what do you do? You either pay your workers less or give them slower raises to, to get that money, or you might cut your dividend. But, you know, this is a competitive capital market. You're not going to be able to attract capital if you're not paying a, a competitive rate of return. So that's a tough thing to do. Or you can raise your prices and see if you can get the customers to kick in a little but th that's it. That's the list. It's like Casablanca. You go through the usual suspects, and the way it generally turns out is workers don't get the raise. So they end up bearing the burden of this tax. Mm -hmm. We see the same movie again and again. You try to tax high-income people, low-income people end up bearing the burden of the tax. We did an analysis of the Elizabeth Warren and, and Bernie Sanders wealth taxes, you know, tiny taxes on the very, very rich. Well, it turns out they control a whole lot of investable capital, and if you tax them at draconian rates— Workers end up bearing 60 cents out of every dollar of wealth tax. That's not a recipe for success. Now, in 2018 or 2019, when the when the Trump tax cuts came into came into effect, that the middle class was experiencing through their paychecks a, a greater a greater amount of share of that through their through their paychecks. So, uh, would I assume correctly that if the, these taxes do go, do go into effect, that again the middle class will be seeing a greater share of these taxes being taken out? Uh, yes, I think there are two things that are really important to remember about this. Number one, uh, in the end, this burden is shifted from the high-income individuals onto the middle class, to the working class, and they bear the burden of that tax. Number two, the claim, which you will hear, you heard it from Secretary Yellen this week, is, oh, no, 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 don't worry about those taxes. We are going to spend this money on stuff that is so productive that it's going to make up for those taxes and, and wages are going to rise. Well, We've actually looked at this pretty carefully, and if you plowed all of the money into very productive infrastructure and R&D, you still won't break even. You're, you've got about a 10% return pre-tax on average in the private sector, you've got a 5% return on productivity and infrastructure and things. So every dollar you take from 10% and give the 5%, you're losing. Mm -hmm. So that's not a winning proposition, and they're not going to spend it all on productive infrastructure. We're going to have a whole bunch that's just transfer programs. This is not the route 
to success for the middle class. Doug, you, I'm glad you brought up about Secretary Yellen, because uh, this week, Secretary of State, Treasury, um, uh, Janet Yellen, said that the tax increases uh, will not cause inflation, but if it does, the Federal Reserve will be starting to raise rates. Will she just walk that back by saying, by no means, because of course this would go to the opposite of what the, the Biden administration wants. But if, if these tax increases do go in effect, they're going to have to raise interest rates, won't they? Well, I think there are two lessons here for uh, Secretary Yellen. Number one, you are no longer the Fed chairman. You should not talk about the Fed. That's a, the, the oldest rule of Treasury secretaries ever. You don't talk about the Fed interest rates. They don't talk about the dollar policy. Everyone uh, gets along just fine. Number two, there's the substance problem. Uh, the Biden administration uh, you know, borrowed nearly $2 trillion and plowed it into the American Rescue Plan uh, in an economy that's already grown at 6 8%, and it came in at over 6 in the, the first quarter. So. There's a real chance of overstimulating the economy, getting a sharp uh, rise in asset price inflation, which I think we've already seen, and then consumer price inflation. And then on top of that, they're, they're going to hit it with some tax increases that will have to get built into the pricing structure. Mm -hmm. That's a dangerous economic combination. She knows it and made the mistake of telling the truth. And, and that's also not a, uh, a lesson she's going to get away with making that mistake many, many times. I mean, I'm sure she, had a phone, she got a phone call when because uh, she walked that back right away Quick. within 24 hours of, of that. The interesting thing to me, Andre, mm -hmm. is someone who's you know, I spent time in two White Houses, I ran the congressional budget office, I've watched this process. Usually when the president has a signature proposal and these are his, the Council of Economic Advisors of the Treasury is very quick to put out a study showing that this will have great benefits for the economy. And they run a simulation model and growth rates going to be up by X or Y or Z. We haven't seen anything. Uh, so they're not willing to defend these proposals on the merits. And I think that's very revealing. That's a good point. I never thought about the, the Council of Economic Advisors. I have not seen anything that came out from that. Right. Doug, we're going to take a break at this moment. We'll be right back. If you're just joining us, we're talking with Douglas Holtz Eakin. Very happy to have him, former director of the Congressional Budget Office. And we'll be back right after this. Uh, Doug, we're glad to have you back again, and, and we were just talking about Janet Yellen. We're talking about the Federal Reserve. Do you have a feeling that next year, um, Jay Powell, who's the chairman of the Federal Reserve, is to be either either renominated by now Joe Biden, or he's going to be getting another uh, another chairman of the Federal Reserve? And I'm sure he wants this job again. So, do you think that will that will pry on his decision whether or not to uh, want to raise interest rates? And if it doesn't work, if it doesn't raise interest rates, what is that going to do for inflation or the worry of inflation? I think, I think it's already affected uh, him personally and the Fed's stance in general. Uh, you know, the, the chairman has a big influence on the stance of the, of the Fed. Mm -hmm. uh, he implored the Congress to uh, have an aggressive fiscal policy. He implored them to go big. They've gone bigger than even people like former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers is comfortable with, and, and I think that's very revealing. Um, and in the face of them going really big and potentially overstimulating the economy, uh, they have not changed their tune one bit. Uh, we have finally saw one, one regional bank president, Robert Kaplan, say, hey, we might want to warn people that, that we might have to raise rates sooner than we thought and sort of take back some of this liquidity. Uh, mm -hmm. But other than that, you know, we've seen uh, arms locked, the stance unchanged. We are going to be as yep. accommodative as we can for as long as we can. And that looks like a Fed chairman who doesn't uh, want to lose his job. And right. he's, he's trying to play along with the administration. Well, in fact, Richard Clarida to, uh, this week was stated that right now, presently, that the Federal Reserve is buying, I think it's $120 billion, correct me if I'm wrong, $120 billion of bonds, $80 billion, which is treasuries, and $40 billion of, of mortgage bonds. And they're just keep, which is basically dumping money into the system, and which I don't feel really needs to be, but they're continuing to do it. But he said he sees no reason why they should even stop. So that's going to continue as well. 
if you think about the American Rescue Plan, uh, that's $400 billion, mostly in the first quarter, dumped into households. Saving rate in the first quarter was 21%. So you, you've got another $100 billion that's going to come out of the household sector and get dumped into financial markets. There's more to come out of that $2 trillion that's going to show up somewhere. Well, I think you end up with a lot of people chasing yield. Mm -hmm. Home prices are uh, rising at rates we haven't seen since the housing bubble. Uh, I don't know if you followed cryptocurrencies this year, but there's a little froth in some of those. In general, there's a lot of cash chasing investment opportunities. And it, it I think, is something that the Fed ought to be more concerned about. There's about $3 trillion globally in cash reserves sitting by. And of that $3 trillion, almost $2 trillion of that $3 trillion is in the United States alone. So I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, that's ready to be deployed, that's sitting in people's checking accounts, savings accounts, um, cash reserves, that are, which would only cause more inflation. Yeah. yeah, for for the average viewer of your show, I, I think it's poorly appreciated how unique this recession has been. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in recessions in the 20th century, income fell and people stopped spending. Incomes never fell in this recession. Private payrolls have grown year over year. Disposable income has grown year over year. It has been augmented by enormous transfers uh, from the federal government. So that wasn't an income problem. It wasn't a wealth problem. Home prices rose, equity markets rose, asset prices in general are up. It was a spending problem because people could not go out in the face of the virus and go to a concert or get on an airplane or have a, uh, a drink at a restaurant. And so we saw the resources to spend show up in the households. They weren't spent. So now they're sitting someplace waiting for it. Okay. So there's a lot of pent up potential to spend out there. Doug, I, I just have one more question for you. It's I'm curious because they're talking about in the next two quarters that the federal government will have to borrow another about 1.3 trillion that's with a t trillion dollars to to help finance of which this will make the about uh, will be about 108 percent of the gdp 108 percent of the gross domestic product what does that mean to our viewers and to the american people if if we're going to be spending more than 108% of GDP, how does that affect the average person, the average homeowner? Well, we're in uncharted territory. We, we entered the pandemic with a federal budget that was unsustainable. You know, spending exceeded revenues as far as the eye could see. We're going to exit the pandemic uh, with the same unsustainable problem and a much higher level of debt, the highest level of debt in the history of this country relative to the size of the economy. It's a, an enormous debt. What does that mean for the average person? It means that every day the federal government is taking dollars that might otherwise go into someone's education, uh, someone's uh, new shop, someone's new uh, piece of equipment, a software upgrade, anything that you might save, invest, and improve the productivity in the economy, you're going to instead shift it over to, to picking up the government's bills. Day by day, that eats away at our ability to compete. Day by day, it eats away at our ability to raise the standard of living and, and pass things to our children. And... Each day's loss is not very big, so you don't see it. You never really know you didn't get it. But if you add that up over long periods of time, you get the kind of stagnation we saw after the Great Recession for year after year after year. No wages growing, people very frustrated. And that's what I see unless we get serious and take this on. Thank you. Doug, got a lot more questions, but unfortunately, the clock doesn't stop. I hope you come back and join us again. We'd love to have you. Well, I'm delighted to be on. Thank you for having me. That was Douglas holt Egan. My, my thanks to Doug. And also in business news, this week, President Joe Biden, well, he was in Louisiana yesterday pushing his case for his $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan. Now, speaking in Lake Charles in front of a 70-year-old bridge, that's about 20 years past its life expectancy and in New Orleans with a backdrop of the Mississippi River and the Greater New Orleans Bridge over his shoulder, his infrastructure package received support in a newspaper editorial last week by Lake Charles Mayor Nick Hunter, a Republican, and Shreveport Mayor Adrian Perkins, a Democrat. Well, there's general agreement with both the Democrats and the Republicans in Washington about the need for infrastructure spending, but there's significant disagreement as to the definition of just what infrastructure is. The president is trying to garner Republican backing. And the definition of infrastructure by Democrats include child care, health services, and other areas in addition to roads and bridges favored by Republicans. Now, he's proposing to pay for his plan by undoing the 2017 tax cuts signed into law by President Donald Trump and raising the corporate tax rate from 21 percent 
to 28 percent. Well, hiring unexpectedly slowed in April, a sign the recovery faces temporary setbacks as many businesses struggle to find workers or remain cautious about the economic outlook. U.S. employers added modest 266,000 jobs in April, a far short amount of the, one, of the 1 million jobs that economists had forecast for the month and the weakest monthly gain since January. Higher vaccination rates, fiscal stimulus, and easing the business restrictions are converging to support stronger spending across the United States. But employers are, are having difficulty in hiring employees with additional $300 federal weekly unemployment checks that will continue for at least another three more months. Employers were offering bonuses and higher hourly pay and other incentives to attract employees. Well, if you've got a question about finance or a comment about the show, we'd love to hear from you. You can write us at andre at wallstreetwrapup.info. Keep it pithy or concise, and we'll be glad to answer your questions. And now for a look ahead for next week. But first, this major U.S. port city was founded on this day, May the 7th, and the games of craps and poker originated in this city. What city was founded on this day? We'll have the answer in just a minute. Stay tuned. The major U.S. port city was founded on this day, May the 7th, and the games of both craps and poker originated in this city. What city is it? New Orleans. Founded in 1718 by Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne Bienville. On this day, May the 7th, 303 years ago today. Well, Krispy Kreme is going public. Krispy Kreme Donuts wants to do to our bank account what they've done to our waistline, make it fatter. The donut company said on Tuesday that it has confidentially filed paperwork related to a public offering of its stock with the Securities and Exchange Commission. The number of shares and price of the stock has not yet been determined. And Krispy Kreme has been doling out the donuts since 1937. The chain has nearly 1,400 locations in 33 countries. And finally, we've heard the adage, selling may go away. Well, but new data is available to say that this may not be correct. Over the last 10 years, the S&P 500 during May has been up 80% of the time. In fact, for the last 70 years, the S&P 500 has been up 1.7% on average in May. Now, seasonally, the summer months have usually been a sluggish period, but with earnings up and pent-up demand, all due to a year of lockdowns, things are looking up. Mark Twain used to have a saying, history may not repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. Well, we'll see in a couple of weeks if this latest data and Mark Twain is correct. Join me next week when my guest will be former CEO of Medtronics and Harvard Business School professor Bill George. That's next week. Well, that's our show. We hope you've enjoyed it for Friday, May the 7th. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook and WYES.org. So thank you for joining us for Wall Street Wrap-Up. I'm Andre Laborde. Remember, money never sleeps. Good night. Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs, through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern.